Okay. Welcome to Show Me What You Got, where these dummies ask me a few questions. <laughs> yeah, today we're going to be covering ESC protocols. So Zach has a lot of expertise. He's been doing software engineer for how many years? Eight years now, so I think I might know what I'm doing. Yeah, so, and Travis and I, on the other hand, don't... Aren't so smart. <laughs> well, we don't really know much about uh, software-related stuff, so we're yeah. going to ask Zach a few questions, and hopefully you guys can learn a little bit from it. What is that communication between the flight controller and the ESC? Alright, so the ESC protocol, or communication between the flight control and the ESC, dictates your percentage of throttle. Full throttle being full battery voltage to the coils. Okay, so there's a bunch of different ways that can be communicated, right? There's PWM, there's one shot 25, there's one shot 42, and D shot, and multi-shot mm -hmm. and all that so you know what's what's the difference pwm one shot 125 one shot 42 and multi-shot are all based off the same premise which is pwm pulse width modulation okay so basically i'm going to show you how that works so what we got here is just a graph of time and what value is going to come over that so um what we're going to do i guess here is we're going to give this is going to be your plus voltage and this is going to be your zero voltage Okay. And this is gonna the value of this is determined by the logic of your processor. So this is a hundred percent throttle, this is zero percent throttle? No. Uh, this is just the signal voltage. Got it. So throttle is actually gonna be measured in time. That's what pulse width modulation is. You're measuring the width of the pulse. How long are you pulsing? So it's a digital communication and it has two values. It's either high or it's low. So what, essentially what we're going to do here with what we're common and used to is 1,000 to 2,000 being our time range. And this is in microseconds. So what we can see is, is if we have a full throttle signal, what we're going to see is it's going to be this shape right here. It's going to be full throttle, just like that. So it's on for two, exactly 2,000 microseconds for full throttle. Got it. If we want to see a partial throttle, let's say 50%, what we're going to see is it's going to come on and it's going to still go all the way up to the top, but it's only going to last for half the duration. Got it. And then if you want quarter throttle, so on and so forth. So the next thing I guess I can show you is the difference between normal PWM with a 1000 to 2000 range and one shot 125, which is no, also known as P, 1 8th PWM synchronized. Got it. So there's two parts to it. The first part, uh, 1 8th means our range is instead of 1000 to 2000 our range is going to go from 125 hence one shot 125 to 250 so exactly one eighth of our previous and these values. are microseconds yes right? these are still microseconds and it works identically the same just the time it measures is much narrower so if we're going to graph it here it's not going to quite make sense because we rescaled it yeah, here so we have two scales so the shape's identical and it works the same way just the frames we look at are much smaller. Okay. So what this enables us to do, so if this was our 2000 range, now we have eight, we could get eight full throttle cycles in here mm -hmm. in the same amount of time. Uh, so, it's, so it's eight times the potential frequency as well. So if I were to change the throttle within 1000 milliseconds or microseconds, mm -hmm. right? In PWM mode, I'd only be able to see a like the next step in my throttle after a thousand microseconds where this I could change my throttle eight times during a thousand microseconds. Yeah exactly so you, since your maximum frame size is 250 mm -hmm. your your frequency of update is every 250 milliseconds you're gonna get a new throttle response. Okay so maybe a, four times faster. Eight that. times faster. Okay eight times faster. So it's one eighth PWM so it's okay. one eighth the period. So you theoretically have eight times the resolution. Eight times throttle. the update frequency. Okay eight times the update frequency in your throttle. Right and then the second half to the one shot is synchronous PWM. So what this refers to is the flight controller runs a PID loop for stabilization and at the end of every stabilization it will update the ESCs. So this is a little different. Traditional PWM means, so if we extend this graph out another 2,000, mm -hmm. right, we're going to get another pulse. And the pulses are going to hit every time we hit a period. With one shot, we can get a staggered period. So it would be something like this, then it could be like this if we ran it faster, then it could wait again like that. So we're only going to get pulses when the flight controller has finished stabilizing. 
Oh, uh, so it only sends the important stuff. Yeah, it only sends it when there's new information. Okay, so you're not just spamming it with the same thing over and over. It's like, oh, there's a new thing. Here you go. Correct. Oh, there's a new thing. Here you go. Okay. Correct. So the way all of this PWM works, one shot, multi shot, all of these, the way it works is based off timers. The timers exist inside the processors or as an external oscillator, but it's essentially, it's going to measure time and you have one on the flight controller and one on the ESC. So what calibration does is you're going to go, hey, flight controller, you have some frequency that your timer runs at. Mm-hmm. Send a send this command to the ESC so it knows what that is. And then send this command to the ESC so it knows what that is. So even if their timers are slightly different, that it still knows where the start and end points are. Let's pretend your flight controller only sent 1,000 at high and zero at low. Mm-hmm. The ESC shouldn't care at that point because it's going, oh, you told me where low was and where high was, and I'll make sense of that on my own terms. Okay, and that's why calibration is important. Because you're telling the ESC, this is minimum, this is maximum, look out for me. Exactly, exactly. So calibration is also important to do on all your ESCs, not just one, because you know there's manufacturing defects, there's all different kinds of things, and things can have slightly variance in timing. So if you see different timings after calibration in BLHeli, don't be alarmed. That is just the system being calibrated to its own timer. It Not all of them are made the same. Yeah, little variations in manufacturing are just, it's yeah. the real world, right? Exactly. Cool. So PWM kind of makes sense now. Okay. Is there a better way of doing this? Is that the optimal way of doing your protocol? So PWM is a decent way to communicate, but the problem is it's still based off analog timing of things. So you have to have timers, and remember we talked about calibration and why it's important, because you have to match mismatched ranges, essentially, because you're not on the same Mm chipset. Not to mention capacitance on the line, resistance on the line, all different kinds of variables can affect your timing. So yeah, uh, there are definitely better ways to do this. D-Shot's a great example of that. So what D-Shot does is it uses something called bit banging, which uses the same idea as PWM, but it's gonna, instead of just measuring the time, you're gonna have defined times for each peak, and we're gonna measure the number of peaks and the number of valleys. So essentially what we're gonna do, is we're gonna take a PWM signal and sort of treat it as a a bit field. We're gonna look at the highs as ones and the lows as zeros within specified timing. Okay. So with this advantage, what we can also get is because we have a specified format of what it is, and it's not just time measurement, we specified the time. So all the times, all the peaks are going to be the same. So we're going to bring the same graph back, and maybe our signal is going to, our signal is going to look something like, like this now. So instead of these being throttle pulses now, what this is, is this is a 1, then a 0, then a 1, then a 1, then a 0, then a 1. Okay. That's what we're going to start reading that as. And this will turn it. This eventually turns into some number once you convert the binary to an actual integer, okay. and then this number is going to either dictate our throttle or whatever it is. So at this point, what we get is an actual number. We're not getting a time that we're measuring anymore. We're getting the data the flight controller sends. We're reading that same exact number. There's not going to be any variation in timing. There's not going to be any mismatches. And then on top of that, what we can do. And what D-Shot does is it will reserve, I don't know exactly, we can go look up the protocol, but it reserves some of these pieces of information for a CRC. What a CRC does is checks that all the rest of the information is correct. Mm. So you run a piece of math on your flight controller and a piece of math on the ESC, and it both if they both have the same CRC, then it's going to go, that was correct data. So now we can throw out any junk data. So if there's some kind of noise on the line that disrupts it, we can just toss it out and ignore that value. And at the same time, there's never going to be jitter in timing because it's an actual digital value. We're sending a number and interpreting a number rather than measuring something. Mm, So you're no longer measuring just a time and saying, okay, that amount of time equates to this number. Now you're actually saying, this pattern here's a 1500. Here's a, okay, so it's absolute always a correct number and if it's incorrect or there's some kind of error it goes goes, something's not right let's move on to the next one exactly so so d shot is a very good way it's a very good upgrade how do these different protocols benefit me like right now i grab my quad i put it on one shot 42 Mm -hmm. i fly around the backyard i come back in 
I put D shot 600 on it, and I go fly around the backyard. Will I notice a difference? Will I see a difference? Or is it like, you know, what is what happens there? Um. All right. So there's there's a couple situations. So you may or may not notice a difference going from a PWM protocol to a digital protocol. Okay. Uh, that depends on a couple things, and it goes back to something known as noise or jitter. So when we're timing, we're going to graph this slightly differently this time. Okay. We're going to pretend we're giving 1,500, so half throttle the entire time. So here's our graph, and we're giving half throttle. What's known as jitter is when it varies slightly like this. So we're always trying to give half throttle, and we're trying to give 1,500, but sometimes we hit 1,501. You know, sometimes we hit 1,498. Okay. And you've probably seen this in your receiver tab, mm -hmm. right? You can yes. see it jumping around. So that <clears throat> that's a double problem. That's a similar problem to this. It's known as jitter or noise, and it happens when your timing's off or you have some kind of sampling that can't sample your data completely correctly, or in the case of your transmitter, it's usually the gimbals. It's not perfectly accurate. It's just the sensor has some noise inherently in the system. Okay. So going from, this was what would happen with analog, and this can be coupled with the timing of your flight controller and the timing of your ESC being slightly mismatched. Okay, so there's a bunch of things that can jitter and they can all add up. Right, so what this that. is doing is you can see it's making your it's making your motor spin up and down, up and down constantly, even if you're not changing the throttle on your end. Now when we go to digital, because we can verify that signal and know we got the right information, we can at least eliminate the signal jitter going to the motor, which is very important because at the same time we're pulling you know 120 amps on some of these setups and amperage is well known to cause electrical noise which can go ahead and interfere with an analog system mm -hmm. so anything you can do to cut out one of those sources of jitter is is good right yeah so it's it's something similar to that hot topic right now of dampening your motors or dampening your flight controller this is dampening your electronics in a sense if your electronics are making noise then how are you going to get something that flies smooth? So when you swap over to D-Shot, you may notice, like, oh, I can crank my P's up. I can, you can start increasing your gains and get more response and sharper flying, and you may even hear some of the oscillations go away. Now, if they're mechanical vibrations and you're all beat up, then you're probably not going to notice much of a change, but on a fresh system, you should be able to tune it a little bit sharper and have it fly a bit smoother. Cool. So, yeah, getting rid of any variable is, is just always good. Mm -hmm. are, are there cons to D-Shot? Like, so there's, you know, there's the pros and cons. What what are the cons for D-Shot? So right now we've only really talked about All pros. Right. Um, so because D-Shot is also just a throttle percentage-based protocol, there's no downside to the performance on that end. The main downside that you could potentially see with D-Shot, the chances are very low. Um, it's a very high-frequency protocol, but the the biggest concern with D-Shot is if you do have a lot of electrical noise on your system, it could start throwing a bunch of packets out, and you could lose control. Uh, oh, because it has a check. It's yeah, saying, it checks it. Oh, that's bad. So, so oh, yeah. let's let's draw this graph again, and let's pretend your electrical system is doing like this, something gnarly, but you're trying to send this, mm -hmm. right? That's going to eventually mess up enough of your packets. That what's going to happen is you're only going to get a packet here and then a packet here and maybe a packet here and there, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of constantly getting packets the entire time, you're only going to get them every now and then. Okay. And so would that so, cause latency? Uh, wouldn't cause latency. It would cause sort of. It would be almost identical to failsafe. Oh, yeah. You know, with oh, failsafe, like when stutter. you're dropping packets and it gets all sticky, yeah. mm -hmm. it'd be exactly like that. Okay. But in the, so, what if that situation happens on a PWM protocol? Would you just get the goods and the bads, and you yeah. kind of just start? So on PWM, you'd get both sides of the signal. You would get all of it, every single part of it. So that oscillation electrically would happen physically on the motor. Would cause tons of heat. Maybe burn a motor. Maybe it's to an extent it just causes you to spin out of control. So, okay. so the benefit. So yeah, so it, it's pros and cons. So with the analog system, it's just going to do whatever happens. Whatever it sees, it's going to try to do. With digital, it's only going to do what it knows it should do. So mm. in that sense, the digital system's better because it has a self-checking mechanism. So the downsides to it are actually its upsides. Yeah, okay. I mean, compared to PWM. Compared to what the alternative yeah, would be. Yeah, okay. 
Um, Can you do better than D Shot? What's like the next step forward? Yeah, yeah. What's the future of ESC Tech? Well, the future, the next step forward would be to get rid of communication protocols altogether. There's no reason. Right now, we have the flight controller processor, the ESC, the ESC, the ESC, the ESC, you know, the receiver, the video transmitter, the camera. Like, look how many, that's all microprocessors. All of them have some form of a microprocessor. And they have to board. talk to each other. And they all have to talk to each other. So, you know, a couple of these parts, like these guys don't really have to talk to each other, the cameras and stuff. They just send their signal once they're done. But, you know, those aren't part of our flight control necessarily. So those so are fine to be standalone. So we don't care about but that. this, we have to get a lot of communication. So what we talked about before, if we want to start getting better and better control, and there's even more motor control theories that we're not approaching right now, we do need a two-way street. Okay. Which is very complicated when it's a separate part. But if we can just get rid of all of this, and it's all ran from a single unit, then we can start getting higher frequencies, more proper updates, and no noise at all, because it's all one system under one timer under one roof. So having one system, would we have to have a more powerful processor than what we're using right now? Like, would F4 or whatever be enough to be able to do that? Um, it should. The question is, can we do it? Um, with you know our current setups can we go hey this this many amp it's the way we traditionally build mm -hmm. you know with the, the boards the way they are and there's no no power filtering no separate battery for your logic side that kind of stuff we could potentially run into a lot of problems uh, but with our current process there's not even just the current ones we use there are plenty of microprocessors out there that can easily handle this thanks for watching show me what you got um, show me what you got in the comments below. Yeah, show us what you got. We did this kind of learning episode to, you know, see how it goes. We haven't really done one of these before. Zach knows a lot of stuff that we are trying to spread to you. And if you learned anything, if you want to learn about other things, you know, if you have any questions, ask them in the comments. We're going to try and make this a series um, of helping everyone learn how quads work, right? Yeah. So please like, please subscribe. It really motivates us a lot to yeah. make more of these, work harder on these. So thanks for watching. Stay sexy, San Diego.